welcome to another episode of The Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and as always, I'm glad you chose to spend some of your time today listening to me talk about military history. Today we'll be wrapping up our series covering the war fought in the Spanish Protectorate of Morocco during the 1920s against the nationalist movement led by Abdel Krim, which has become known to history as the Rif War. Last time we looked at the decisive changes wrought in this seemingly endless conflict by the entry of the French into the struggle in 1925. Their intervention opened up a new front against the rebellion in the south, and pitted the victorious rebels against a very powerful new adversary. In concert with a well-conducted amphibious assault on the heart of the Riffian territory at al Husaymus Bay by the Spanish, the French trapped Abdel Karim and his forces in a net surrounded by hundreds of thousands of enemy soldiers. My sources for this one will be the same three books I have used for the rest of the series, namely Rebels in the Riff by David Woolman, The Betrothed of Death by Jose E. Alvarez, and Prima de Rivera and Abdel Krim, PhD dissertation by Shannon Fleming. So, with that said, let's return to the Rift, and the winter of 1925 begins with the rebels still strong but on their back foot, and their Spanish and French antagonists making preparations to follow up their successes of the previous year. A decisive stroke against the rebels in September and October of 1925 foreclosed the prospects of a Riffian victory, but did not by itself achieve their defeat. The Abdel Krim brothers, along with most of the principal Riffian leaders, as well as the core of their army, had retreated into the rugged mountains at the heart of the territory of the Beni Urguel, the town of Targuis. Here, deep in the inaccessible heart of the country, they were prepared to carry on the fight, though victory by now must have seemed quite hopeless. Despite the major setbacks suffered by the rebels, their forces still actually controlled the greater part of the territory of Spanish Morocco. The Spanish army would be compelled to mount a further campaign into the heart of the Rif in order to finally bring the war to an end. Victorious at last and full of confidence, the troops were eager to get on with the final battle in this long and painful struggle. Their determination was accompanied by a reduction in the resentment of the part of the Africanistas of Primo de Rivera's policy of abandoning much of the territory won in the previous years. The results seemed to have borne out the wisdom of the policy of reducing Spain's commitments in the protectorate. The policy of the dictator seemed to have brought the army closer to victory than it had ever been able to achieve before, while still compelled to hold on at heavy cost to the overextended lines in the West. Of course, the entry of the French into the conflict against Abdel Krim's nascent regime was also a contributing factor in the reversal of fortune that occurred in the second half of 1925. Their own position was much more secure than that of the Spanish. Nearly all the rebels had been cleared out of the French zone in the fighting between September and November. They therefore had the option to simply fortify the zonal border and leave the rest of the fight to the Spaniards. However, this is not a wise solution from a long-term perspective, as the rebellion, even if confined to the Spanish protectorate, would still continue to threaten the peace of French Morocco until it was ended once and for all. Therefore, the French determined to assist the Spanish in bringing an end to the war. However, further major undertaking after the combined al Husaymus and Huerga offenses would have to wait. A certain amount of operational exhaustion afflicted both European armies and the forces left at Abdel Krim's disposal. The winter, with its inclement weather and frequent rains, also forced a lowering of the intensity of operations. But as the spring approached, preparations for a renewed struggle intensified. In February 1926, Primo de Rivera and the French commander in Morocco, the great war hero Marshal Patin, met in Madrid to plot the final offensive. These talks eventually led to conferences between the high commands of each army in the second half of March. These plans called for a coordinated advance into the Beni Uruguay territory from the north, east, and south. The plans called for a striking change in the tactics used by the Spanish. Rather than the slow, cautious advances, the Spanish were to conduct comparatively rapid, incisive advances. Heavy artillery was to be left behind, as was the old tactical concept built around fixed positions and continuous lines of posts. Instead, the Spanish outlined a type of campaign which bore the mark of the lessons they had learned from their enemies. Constant movement, swift maneuver, and the avoidance of costly defensive battles and expensive siege and supply operations were employed in the final offensive. This was another aspect of the change brought about in the Spanish army by the harrowing experience of this war and one that would change the character of the war that the Spaniards would fight amongst themselves in their own country ten years later. While this was going on, the country was by no means quiet. As the talks between the French and Spanish got underway, they received an unmistakable reminder that the war was not yet over. Ahmed Herrero and his Jabali Harkas, though defeated at Kudia Tahar, were still in the field. They had secreted a number of artillery pieces on the heights of the mountain of Gorges, just outside of Tatuan. From here they shelled the city. As they had done in the fighting between Sebadia Beach and Ashtir, Rippians were compelled to take measures to hide their guns from Spanish air observation. Typically, they wheeled their guns out of caves and other places of concealment, fired on the town until Spanish aircraft appeared, at which point they were quickly moved back into cover. The shelling was desultory, and little damage was actually inflicted on the town, which, to remind the listener, was the capital not only of Spanish Morocco, but of all the African colonies left of Spain. 
Unsurprisingly, the victorious Spanish moved quickly to eliminate this galling thorn in their side. They used a very strong force composed of four columns of infantry supported by 11 batteries of artillery. Of the four columns, two were composed of regular infantry and support troops, one was made up of men from the Regularis, and the fourth was composed of four banderas of the Tercio, led by the formation's commander, the newly promoted Colonel Milan Estray. The assault began on the 4th, and by the 6th, the last of the rebels on the mountain were being mopped up. The unlucky Milan Estray, founder of the Legion, who had recently returned to his old position as Legion's commander, was once again badly wounded in this operation, this time in the face, which would result in a loss of an eye. He had been promoted to colonel after Alphysamus and had been reinstated as commander of the Tercio after the departure of Franco. Franco had given up this post after his promotion to brigadier general. Thus, the protege, having used it very successfully as a vehicle for the advancement of his career, handed the Tercio back to his old master. During the period of the Tercio engaged in a number of guerrilla saw operations against the disorganized Riffians. A special unit, known as the Hios de la Noche, or the Sons of the Night, was formed at Alphysamus under the command of his sergeant San Giorgio. In a raid on the night of the 21st of March, these men left the Tercio post at Bientieb and slipped through the Riffian positions to Akarasen, where a meeting of tribal chiefs was being held. Legionarios snuck up to the house in which this conference was occurring, silently dispatched the sentries, and climbed up onto the roof. From here they tossed grenades in among the astonished Riffian leaders, who were all blown to bits. They also sought to strike at the territory of the Beni Hasmar, Ahmed Herrero's tribe. This was done by another amphibious assault, on a similar scale to the landing at Alcazar Sabir at Emsa, in the border area between the Beni Hasmar and the Beni Said. Spaniards succeeded here in bringing about the submission of the tribes once more. While these operations were going forward, another Spanish column under Lieutenant Colonel Asensio marched against the Beni Asef and the Al Sarif tribes of the Lucus region. They were successful in quickly reducing the resistance of the rebels here and further eliminating the threats remaining in the far west of the Protectorate. The victorious Spanish, having at last clearly gained the upper hand over their stubborn foes, were intent on completing the destruction of the rebel cause altogether and capturing Abdel Krim and his brother. They were adamantly opposed to peace now that victory was in their grasp. The Africanistas, in particular, were opposed to any negotiated solution, as this would constitute in the eyes of many a loss against the Riffians, who they and many others would have regarded as only a half-civilized or even savage collection of native tribesmen. The total suppression of this kind of revolt was the only honorable conclusion for an imperial power according to this point of view. Nevertheless, pressure to treat with the rebels was strong and growing, the Riffian cause had gained worldwide sympathy. This was not long after the conclusion of the Great War, and many proclamations and propaganda campaigns concerning the rights of small nations and weaker peoples to security and self-determination were still fresh in the minds of thinking people everywhere. To them, it seemed that the French and Spanish were committing just such an act of aggression and denial of the right of self-determination as that which had been so justly denounced when the Germans committed similar outrages on the Belgians and the people of occupied France, not to mention the numerous peoples of the Eastern European imperial territories. Worse still, their aggression was being carried out against the people even more overmatched and outnumbered, and for no better reason than to gain military glory or for the profits of foreign capitalists. For this reason, then, when the Riffians sent emissaries to discuss peace terms in the spring of 1926, the French and the Spanish saw fit to come to the negotiating table. The Europeans, however, had little reason other than public opinion to hear the Riffians out. The rebels were trapped between two large armies, and their eventual defeat and total suppression could be taken for granted. A preliminary conference was convened at a French fort known as Camp Berteau. Here, an agenda was agreed for a later discussion at the town of Ushta between the proper representatives of each side. This included four points. 1. The recognition of the Sultan's authority over the Rif. 2. The return of European prisoners held by the Riffians. 3. The disarmament of the revolted tribes. and 4. The expatriation and disposal of Abdel Krim himself. At this preliminary meeting, the Europeans made stringent demands in relation to handing over of prisoners, and the occupation of certain territories to ensure, quote, strategic security. These demands led to Riffian resistance, and as a result, the conference at Oshtal was delayed till the end of April. At this conference, the major issue of contention was the degree of autonomy that would be allowed the Riff under the post-war settlement. Europeans promised autonomy within the restrictions to which they were obligated under certain existing international treaties. However, as these treaties reached into governing crucial areas of Riffian life, such as the rights to the mineral wealth of their mountains, were concluded by negotiations to which the Riffians had not been a party, these conditions were too galling to accept. Proposals were accepted on the other three points with some small caveats, such as Riffian insistence that the disarmament of the tribes be undertaken by Abdel Krim's authorities rather than by the Europeans. This was allowed for practical reasons, as it was much more likely that the tribesmen would actually surrender their arms, rather than concealing them, to their own people instead of the Spanish or French armies. 
The Spanish wanted Abdel Karim turned over to them, most likely to be executed, but they agreed to settle for his deportation and exile instead, perhaps hoping to get their hands on him later. However, as they had done before, negotiations broke down over the autonomy issue, and even in their extremity, the ruffians held out for total independence rather than the illusion of autonomy that was offered to them. On the 1st of May, the Europeans made their final offer, an ultimatum requiring refereeing compliance with their terms and the release of all their prisoners within a week. Abdel Krim, now establishing his new stronghold at Targuis, rejected this demand. The peace talks, which neither party had been very enthusiastic about, came to an end. The fight would go on. The Rift still had perhaps 12 to 14,000 men under arms, including the cream of their forces and the tough Beni Irigwell regulars, an almost intact core of their army, armed and trained in the style of their European enemies. French and Spanish troops, as well as their colonial auxiliaries, surrounded them in their mountains with nearly half a million men. Doomed though they may seem, the rebels chose to fight on. One of the complicating factors in the negotiation at Ushta concerned the question of the European prisoners held by the rebels. Many thought that the Riffians were delaying the return of the prisoners to prevent the exposure of the cruel and inhumane treatment that these unfortunates had undergone. This may have been true. Reports of Riffian treatment of their prisoners vary widely, as it probably did in fact. Some reports describe cruel and blood-curdling tortures and executions. Some report poor treatment and humiliating, but not atrocious, conduct, such as one report which describes Abdel Krim's jailers as feeding their captives bread in which dirt had been mixed with the dough, but nothing much worse than this. Still others, many ex-prisoners themselves, describe their captors as rough but fair-minded, and if the prisoners went hungry and suffered from typhus, they were no worse off than the Riffians, who shared these same hardships. Cruel and inhumane actions were by no means limited to the Riffians, however. The Europeans, especially the Spaniards of the Tercio and the Regulares, were known to have been just as cruel and to have in fact celebrated this cruelty. For example, after the savage actions at Kudia Tahar, soldiers of the victorious Banderas of the Tercio marched back to Tetuan with the grisly trophies of their success. These included severed body parts, including human hearts and heads, carried triumphantly aloft on bayonets as they marched through the town, and strings of severed ears bound on cords proudly shown off to the Tetuanis. These were in fact carried in review before the dictator during the victory parade through the town, an occurrence which led Primo de Rivera to issue a directive that such barbarism should never recur. Nevertheless, a Captain Hernandez, who served with the Tercio at this time, told how, after the battle, he and his men had had the heads and genitals of the slain Jabalis and Riffians sent back to their reserve formations in the city, who had built a huge bonfire and burned them in the Plaza de España, which was the main public square. The French were not very much better in this regard, and more than one group of foreign legionnaires was photographed holding up the severed heads of their enemies. Aerial bombing of undefended villages was also engaged in by both the French and the Spanish, who used primitive napalm bombs and poison gas on villages that they must have known could only have been occupied by women, children, and the old and infirm. Early on, the French organized a special air unit, known as the Escadrille Sharifienne, composed almost entirely of American volunteer pilots, flying support of their troops in Morocco. It was formed in Paris in July of 1925, and included 17 Americans and four or five Frenchmen. The squadron was in large part the creation of an American, a man named Charles Sweeney. This man had flown during World War I, and having acquired a taste for combat, saw an opportunity in the fighting now spilling into the French zone of Morocco. He approached the French government with an offer to raise a fighting squadron of veteran American pilots in the spring of 1925. This offer was accepted by the French government and their prime minister at the time, Paul Penleif. Sweeney then sent a series of telegrams to other great war veteran airmen in the States. One of these, addressed to his former compatriot Paul Ayers Rockwell, read, quote, Proposed reforming Lafayette Escadrille, which was an American volunteer squadron that had phoned for the French before the American entry into World War I, have half a dozen members already lined up. Would like you to join. Well, Rockwell did join and was among the 17 men that were assembled in July and who made their way to Morocco. The U.S. State Department was hardly enthusiastic about the participation of their nationals in a struggle in which the country was neutral. This obvious violation of U.S. neutrality law resulted in threats against the volunteers, who were told that they were liable to lose their citizenship, among other penalties, if they chose to fight for the French. But these warnings were insufficient to deter the volunteers. They were given Great War surplus brigade aircraft and organized on very informal lines. No formal enlisted contracts or oaths of allegiance. They were paid the equivalent of $40 a month, out of which they were required to buy their own meals, and were free to leave at any time. In Morocco, the Escadrille Sharifienne flew 470 missions and logged thousands of hours of flight time, mostly in scouting and bombing missions. No air-to-air -air combat occurred here. There was a rumor that Abdel Krim had hired German and British fighter pilots to fly for him, and the American pilots sought out these enemy flyers eagerly, 
but they were never encountered if they in fact existed. The Escadrille Sharifian, as well as the rest of the European air effort against the tribesmen, was harshly criticized in many quarters as a barbaric and dishonorable method of warfare against a less well-equipped enemy. The United States shared heavily in this opprobrium due to the presence of its aviators in the French effort. This was greatly magnified by the bombing of Shaoen, which had been declared an open city on the 17th of September 1925. Many civilians were killed in this raid, which was regretted bitterly by at least one of the Americans. Rockwell describes his feelings about the raid in these words. Our objective was Chef Shaoen, a holy city of the Jabala tribesmen, a place of some 7,000 inhabitants. It had not been bombarded previously, and because of its prestige and sacredness as a holy shrine, an air attack against it was expected to intimidate the Jabalis and be effective in detaching them from the cause of Abdel Krim. I regretted having to attack a town that had always maintained its independence except for a few years of Spanish occupation. The city looked lovely from the air, hugging its high mountain and surrounded with many gardens and green cultivations. I looked down upon numerous sanctuaries, the six mosques, the medieval dungeon, and a big square with its fountain playing and fervently hoped that none of them had been damaged. Much damage was inflicted, however, and the incident became a highly publicized event. The backlash was very strong, particularly in the U.S. and France, a factor that led to pressure to disband the squadron. This, it must be remembered, was one of the very first bombing attacks on an undefended town to become widely known to a larger public, which was still shocked by this kind of thing in the 1920s. In any case, the existence of the Escadrille Sharifian was ended in November 1925, when the unit was disbanded following the assignment of regular squadrons of the French Air Corps to Morocco, following the build-up for the move north of the Huerga. While the futile talks at Ushta were underway, the Spanish were assembling a powerful force to undertake the final offensive into the Beni Urguel. This consisted of 15,000 men under General Carrasco, who were assembled at Midar during the second half of April. This force was organized into four columns, led by Colonels Benigno Fisher, Amado Balmes, and Emilio Mola. Ten years later, the last mention of these would be the principal organizer of the revolt against the Second Republic. The infantry columns were accompanied by one of cavalry under Major Monasterio, and backed up by a reserve column under General Dola. Including all service troops and reserves, more than 25,000 men were assigned to the offensive. Field command of the operation was given to Castro Llorona, who was subordinate to the Spanish commander of all forces in Africa, General Sanyorio, and to his chief of staff, Oded. The Spanish High Command had relocated its headquarters to the conquered Ashtir in order to better oversee the campaign. The Spanish attack was to be joined by a French effort in the south. The French were organized for a three-pronged drive into the rift. This got underway on the 15th of April, Ironically, on the same day that the peace conference in Ushta began, 40,000 French soldiers were involved in the attack, and as they advanced, the southern face of the vice squeezing the remaining rebels was set in motion. The rebels found themselves at last completely surrounded not long after the French move, as a concurrent local advance by the Spanish met them on the eastern flank, at set to Anamar in the territory of the Metalsis Rock. The main Spanish drive began on the 8th of May. The nature of the country into which they were penetrating militated against the kind of mobile tactics envisaged in the plans of the Spanish High Command. Like the landscape over which they had fought their way into Ashtir, the country of the Beni Irigwell homeland was full of rocky hills with boulder-covered slopes and high peaks and steep-sided valleys. This was perfect defensive terrain, especially for the kind of defense typically employed by the Ripian Harkas. Land was sparsely populated and scattered over with small villages inhabited by a very hostile population. The experienced Africanistas knew well how dangerous these seemingly weak and harmless villages could be if left unsubdued in the rear, they were very aware of the need to take care that their flanks were secure and the people of these villages pacified. It was a neglect of these two factors which had led to the situation which had destroyed Sylvester's army after the defeated on wall. The rising of the arms of the still dangerous tribes through which his army had advanced in the wake of the defeat caused the subsequent collapse of the Spanish defensive network in 1921. A similar rallying of the local peoples to strike the Spanish during a time of vulnerability had contributed heavy to the bloody cost of the withdrawal from Shaoen. This need to thoroughly pacify a hostile armed population greatly complicated the kind of mobile operations with open flanks that had been discussed in the planning phase of the operation, and gave a strong incentive to brutality and arbitrary violence against the inhabitants in order to frighten them into quiescence. In the vanguard of the Spanish advance were, as always, the Tercio and the Regulares. The objective of the first day were the positions of Pista Prisioneros, Rebaba, and Afgar. These were part of an entrenched defensive line the Ripians had constructed along the river Ibalokan, which was backed up by a sizable force of artillery. Seven Banderas of the Tercio took part in this assault. Under the support of their mortars and machine guns, they advanced against an estimated 12,000 Ripians and took their objectives, then withstood determined Ripian counterattacks supported by artillery and mortars of their own. 
The battles here were savage and strongly contested, with many casualties on both sides and much loss of materiel. The last major battle of the war, another costly slugfest, was fought during this phase of the advance over the position of Ath Hashim, or the Hill of the Saints, to the southeast of Ashtir. A three-day back-and-forth battle here broke the back of the Benny Iroquois' fighting power. In this series of bitter actions, the Riffians lost over a thousand men. For the Spaniards, the cost was higher, close to 1,300. All along the area of the Spanish advance, the Riffians launched strong counterblows. These reposts were thrown back, however, and the next three days the Spanish would continue their slow advance against stiff resistance. The leading edge of the Spanish advance approached the town of Tafras, which was taken by four banderas of the Tercio in a close quarters assault with bayonet and grenade. This brought them out of the Riffian defensive zone behind the Iberlokan, and here they halted for three days. Meanwhile, other Spanish forces attacked on the western and eastern flanks. A column under Colonel Sebastian Poses started from the newly subdued territory of the Beni Said. Another, under Colonel Miguel Campin, started from the southern portion of the Malia sector, while a third, under Colonel Miguel Ponte, attacked from the Matalsa. Only Ponte's men encountered serious resistance when they met a stout Riffian defense at the strategic market town of Salta de Asla. After much expenditure of ammunition, they pushed the Riffians out of the town at last, but only at the cost of more than 120 casualties. On the southern front, the French moved north from the Worga Valley in two strong columns, one each under General Ibos and Dose, which was soon joined by a third, somewhat smaller force under General Garniers. Overhead, the drive of the two armies into the heart of the rift was supported by eight squadrons of Spanish planes and ten from the French Flying Corps. On the 10th, the rebels tried their strategy of diversion again and mounted renewed operations in the west to try and draw some of the Spanish troops away from the advance into the rift. In a repetition of the Kudia Tahar attack, the diversionary assault was carried out by a thousand Jabali and Gomari troops led by Ahmed Herrero against the positions of the Primo line near Tetuan. These hit the position of Wadi Martil, as well as two other posts, surrounded them and attempted to reduce them with the familiar siege tactics and artillery bombardments. Their operations once again put Tetuan itself under direct threat, with rebel positions less than 11 kilometers, or about 7 miles from the city. In one action on the 16th, Four companies of the 6th Bandera under Captain Carlos Rubio were operating in the Beni Madan sector between Cudia Tahar and the Mediterranean coast. As they were beginning to cross the Martine River in this area, they were caught by surprise in a fusillade from the rebels holding strong positions on the opposite bank. The Spanish quickly deployed from column and laid down a barrage of machine gun fire and mortar bombs. Under the cover of this fire, one company crossed the stream and hit the rebels on their left flank. One by one, the other companies fought their way across. A vicious struggle between the Legionarios and the Gamares raged all day near the river, until in the late afternoon the Spanish were ordered to withdraw. Both sides lost heavily in this inconclusive action, with Tercio losing three officers and seven men killed, as well as 58 more badly wounded. Fighting around Tetuan went on for nine more days, when, again in a scene familiar from the Cudio Tahar episode, the Spanish relief column headed by two banderas of the Tercio, this time the 5th and 6th, broke the siege of Budara, the last endangered position, and put Herrero's force decisively to flight. In these operations, the Spanish army was assisted by bombardments from the navy. This was a heavy defeat for the rebels in the west, who left 99 dead and 25 wounded on the field, as well as many of their weapons, including all of their artillery. Though the Jabala and the Gamara were by no means tranquil after Herrero's defeat here, the danger posed to the Spanish colonial capital was ended, and Spanish control over the western commandancia was no longer disputed. Nevertheless, Ahmed Herrero himself remained at large, and would continue to fight on. On the 15th, the Spanish renewed their main advance, minus the 5th Bandera, which had been sent to the assistance of the 6th in the Tetuan sector. They pushed on from the line around Tafra to capture Sidi Yusuf and Beba Arba. Once again, the advance was strongly contested by the Riffians, prominent among whom were the elite Beni Uruguel regulars, formidable troops who were capable of defeating even the cream of the Tercio on their own terms. Losses on both sides were heavy in this bitter struggle. Nevertheless, on the 17th, the Spanish had taken Thomasent, town second only to Ashtir in the Rift. They had also made their way across the Nikor River, one of the last such barriers between themselves and Abdel Krim, and had taken a bridgehead around the position of Sidi Baki on the opposite side. The next day, the advance continued, and a force led by five Banderas pushed through to Zoko El Arba de Tarut, approximately 10 kilometers, or about 6 miles south of Thomasent. Here, they met Campis Column coming from the Malia sector. This cut the territory of the Beni Uruguel in half. On the same day, from their positions in the highlands, Spanish forces caught sight of the distance of the French advancing towards them. Two days later they would meet, and this junction of the major European forces cut the whole of the Rift in two. By the 23rd, Poses' column had taken Anwal and Sidi Dries, and the entirety of the country behind the advancing European lines was being pacified. 
On the same day, the Spanish overran Abdel Karim's headquarters at Targus. The rebel leaders themselves, however, had fled, and all the Spanish took were his papers, books, and a flag of the Rift Republic. Among the papers were letters addressed to General Sanurio and the French resident general, Stig, asking for peace. The Prince of the Rift had sent a message to Colonel Korab, leading the nearest French column, informing the Frenchmen of his decision to surrender. The French had dispatched officers to meet with the rebel chief. They met in the house of a man named Hamido al Wazami, and there Abd al Krim agreed to release all of his prisoners on the 26th and to surrender himself the next day in exchange for a guarantee of the safety of his family and himself. His action was hastened by a large and growing possibility of assassination by his now emboldened subordinates who may have resented him for their own reasons. One such man, Mohammed Maknasi, had already betrayed him during the move from Tagris by revealing Abd al Krim's hiding place to the French, who bombed the place on this information. The rebel chief's terms were immediately granted, and the rebel leader duly surrendered himself to them according to his agreement. On the 28th, the unfortunate prisoner staggered into Targowitz. 111 Spanish prisoners, including two women and four children, remained alive. The 105 soldiers that had survived were all enlisted men. The officers had all been shot in retaliation for Spanish bombing raids on Rippian villages. 60 French prisoners, including 19 civilians, were also released as well as 11 Algerian and Senegalese soldiers captured while fighting in the French colonial forces. These represented only about half of the Spanish and French nationals believed to have entered Rippian captivity. The others died from typhus, bad food and conditions, ill treatment, and the hundred other hardships of life in enemy captivity. The Rippian leader remained in French captivity until the 2nd of September, when he and his brother, along with their families and staff, were embarked on a French warship and delivered to their new home on exile on the island of Reunion in the Indian Ocean. Here, the defeated Prince of the Rift would remain until 1947, when he jumped ship on the harbor of Port Said in Egypt and was given asylum. He lived there in Egypt until the 5th of February, 1963, when he died of a heart attack in Cairo. After the Rifian surrender, operations continued in the country. Though many rebels gave up the fight with Abdel Krim, many did not, and numerous villages and towns had to be subdued before the Spanish protectorate was returned to the state of relative tranquility it had known before the Rift Rebellion. In August, the Spanish marched back into the evacuated portion of their western commandancia and reoccupied the positions abandoned in the 1924 withdrawal, including Shaoen. As Primo de Rivera had promised while trying to convince the Africanistas to countenance the withdrawal, the Spanish had indeed returned to Shaoen and took it back without a struggle. A further campaign involving three columns moving west from Targuist and east from Shaoen mopped up the rebel forces still fighting in the Gomara and the western Rift. By the end of October, the Spanish were decisively in control of almost the whole of the country. According to a statement of San Jurio, 55 of the 66 tribes of Spanish Morocco had submitted, and a further seven had done so partially. Since February, the Spanish had taken almost 30,000 rifles, 135 cannon, and 200 machine guns from the rebels. By the end of the year, the Spanish had eliminated almost all resistance to the protectorate. Deep in the hinterlands of the Rif, the Gamara, and the Jabala, however, the small hardcore refused to submit. In the beginning of 1927, as the Spanish were planning their final operations against the rebel holdouts, they were suddenly confronted by a new threat rising from among the diehards. This was a growing army in the southern Gemara, led by a marabout, a religious leader, known as Selitan or Slitan. This man led an uprising of the kind that had been familiar to the Spanish here since the days before the Protectorate. Slitan held power in the Sinhaja Shrir, a mountainous region in the geographical center of the Protectorate known for its tall cedar forests. He had the backing of a large number of fighters from the Beni Ahmed, Amas, and Beni Khalid tribes, and had consolidated his position during the winter months. On the 26th of March, he and his men made their first defensive move and marched against a Spanish outpost called Toxfoot, located in the mountains of the Sinaja. The post was held by the men of the Regulares. After a six-hour struggle, they were overcome by their more numerous attackers, who put all but one of their surrendered enemies to the knife. The next day, the column of the Sultan's paramilitary police force, the Mahala, led by Spanish Captain Luis Osteris, marched from Targos to deal with this upstart. The force was 245 strong, but Slitan's men caught them in a sudden ambush among the steep ravines of the area and annihilated them. Fearing the consequences of the rise of another successful and charismatic leader among the as-yet undefeated peoples of the area, the High Command took this threat very seriously. The strong forces were mobilized to deal with it before it could become very dangerous. Senorio and Godad moved their headquarters to Villa Senorio on the 28th, so as to be better able to direct operations against the new rebels. Three strong columns were organized to deal with Slitan's forces. They were led by Mola, Pozos, and Colonel Luis Salans. Each were led by a bandera of the Tercio, with one more marching in reserve. Furthermore, two more stationed in the Western Commandancia were ordered to board the ship Vicente Ferrar and proceed to Alexamus, 
but it acted as the nucleus of a strategic reserve. The three columns assembled for the attack consisted of more than 7,000 men. He set out on the 1st of April, leaving Targoist and heading for the Sanaja. Their mission was to proceed slowly and methodically through the highlands and wooded valleys of the region, locating all centers of rebellion and eliminating them. The route took them through the territory of the Beni Bakir, whom they reduced to submission on the way. The swift and decisive response to the Spanish to this new and unexpected threat illustrates some of the changes in the Spanish army brought about by the war in the Rift. This energetic effort was suddenly put into jeopardy by a freak blizzard that hit the Gamara on the 11th of April. The intense cold, as well as the snow and ice, put an end to all movement, forced the Spanish soldiers into bivouac. For three days, they were halted and completely cut off from outside aid. Sayurio, fearing that a determined assault by Sleetan's men at this time could devastate his immobilized force, sent planes to fly recon and support missions to the snowbound troops, watching out for approaching rebel troops and other enemy movement. Some Gamari snipers did approach and harass the Spaniards, but on the whole the blizzard seems to have halted Sleetan as well, and no major attack materialized. On the 14th, the weather began to lift, and the Spanish began to break up their camp, reform themselves, and prepare to move on. They had faced down both the weather and the enemy harassment with no signs of demoralization. This is another mark of the changes wrought in the Spanish military by the ordeal of the preceding five years. The columns reorganized themselves and continued the advance on Sanaja. On the 18th, they took and burned the villages of Ugerden, Buremden, Tamazaran, and Asenjo. Critical success was gained on the 22nd, and the Spanish took the Tilma Pass, and a force led by the 2nd and 3rd companies of the 1st Bandera of the Tercio seized the important town of Tabarant without a fight. On the same day, the rebels slipped in behind the advancing Spanish and attempted to cut their lines of communication back towards Targos by attacking the outpost of Sidi Miskent. This post was held by 40 men of the Regimento de Melilla, a regular conscript infantry regiment. These men put up an obstinate defense against a determined assault by a rebel force many times their number. In the merciless firefight, only four Spanish soldiers remained unwounded. They succeeded in repulsing the attackers, who left many of their dead on the field, including their leader, Mohan Astad, a man who had been one of Abdel Krim's senior lieutenants. The stout and unyielding defense put up by the 40 men here shows yet another aspect of the effect of the war on the Spanish army. Regular infantry, of such dubious value in the first years of the war, could now be relied upon to give a good account of themselves, even in strenuous conditions and while fighting at a clear disadvantage. The Spanish pushed into the territory of the Katama tribe, and on the 7th of May had brought about the subjugation of the rebels there. Sleetan and his adherents withdrew and regrouped in the direction of Zhaoen, making a new headquarters in the village of Ankad. The Spanish sent another force of three columns into the Jabala to wipe out the remaining foci of rebellion there. This force totaled 14,000 men under the overall command of the commanding general of the Sueta sector, Frederico Berenguer. These men pushed southwest from the Tetuan area and into the territory of the Beni Arras and Sumata tribes. The advance began on the 29th of April, before the pacification operations in the Katama had been concluded. The attack met heavy resistance, but by the 13th the Beni Arras had submitted to the invaders, who then moved on to the Sumata. These resisted even more desperately, but after a 10-day struggle they were also brought to heel, the exception of a few who chose instead to flee southwards and continue the fight. With the submission of these two tribes, pacification of the central Jabala was finally effected. Having rested and reinforced their columns, the Spanish pushed on to the south. The advance of the Spanish columns had trapped the remaining Jabali and Gamari rebels in a shrinking pocket to the southwest of Shaolin. Here, the last skirmishes of the Long Rebellion were fought against the most obstinate of the rebels. The Tercio, as usual, was in the hottest part of this fight. On the 15th of June, the Legionarios fought their last major action of the Rift War. First and 8th Banderas, forming the vanguard of a column commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Sans de Lorraine, engaged a large number of Sleetan's men at the village of Kudia Saba. They emerged victorious in this, and remained in possession of the battlefield, the newly taken stronghold occupied by the 29th Company of the 8th Bandera. This final action was also typically bloody, with 36 casualties among the Legionarios, likely many more among Sleetan's men. Three days after this final action, the founder and commander of the Legion, Milan Estray, was promoted, like Franco, to Brigadier General. The promotion required him to relinquish his post as the Legion's commander. He was replaced by the man who had led the last battle, Sans Stalorine, who was himself promoted to full colonel. The departure of Milan Estray from the Legion is the end of the first part of the story of this crack formation. This period of its career was marked by its initial organization, development of its ethos and tactical doctrine, under leadership of Milan Estray and Franco, who thus left their distinctive mark on the entire Spanish army, the rest of which now took its example from the elite legionarios.
The new commander would continue the evolution of the Tercio during the following period of peace, which was the first that it had known. The rebellion was finally ended on the 8th of July. On this day, Sleetan, still unconquered, but facing certain defeat in the battle with the oncoming Spaniards, fled south across the Zornal border into the French zone. Here, with seven or eight hundred of his closest followers, he disappeared in the countryside and was never heard from again. With his flight from the country, the Rift War may be said to come to an end at last. On the 10th, Sanyorio declared the protectorate of Morocco fully pacified. He wrote in a proclamation to the Spanish people, quote, With the operations carried out today, the last remains of the rebellion have been crushed, and the fighting in Morocco is brought to conclusion. The last 18 years, this campaign has constituted a problem for various governments, sapping the nation of its lifeblood and its moral and economic energies. In order to maintain the legacy of pride and gallantry which we inherited from our ancestors, the conquerors of a world. And so with that said, we come to the end of the Record of Arms examination of the Rift War. I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful. I must say I myself have learned an enormous amount about this conflict, and about Spain and Morocco in general, from doing the research for this series. I was drawn to look into it for my interest in the Spanish Civil War, as so much of the background of that conflict including the formative early career experiences of so many of the principal actors involved, were formed by the experience of this long and bloody conflict. I want to thank all of my listeners who made it all the way through this series with me. I love working on this show, and the series has occupied a good deal of my time over the past few months, and it's been a source of real pleasure to prepare and present this for you all. Next time, we'll return to our other series and go back to the war-torn Pacific of 1942 and the wartime career of the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber and the U.S. Navy carrier squadrons that flew them into battle. In the last episode of this series, we looked at the dive bombers' vital contribution to victory in the pivotal Battle of Midway, in which they were the principal instrument of the destruction of the Japanese carrier striking force. This time, we'll look at the next major naval campaign in the Pacific, that associated with the American landings on the island of Guadalcanal. So, I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.